Thank you for joining us here on this uh, Sunday afternoon for a Bible study here at the Liberty Church of Christ. We certainly miss being together and, and we, we certainly are proud of those who have filled in and given Bible lessons and I want to thank them. When we were children, we were taught many stories about Old Testament characters, stories that we've taught our children. Any young person who has regularly attended Bible classes can tell you all about Noah and the ark, Daniel and the lion's den, David and Goliath, Cain and Abel, many others. As we grew older, we taught these same stories to our children. I believe that the Bible in its entirety is the divinely inspired word of God. Therefore, I believe that anything written in the Old Testament was placed there for a purpose. In Galatians 3.24, Paul states that the old law was our tutor or a teacher or a schoolmaster, whichever version you want to read it from, to bring us to Christ. In Hebrews, we are told that the old law was no more in effect, having been replaced by a new covenant. Now, if the old law is to be our schoolmaster, what is it supposed to teach us? What are all those stories we remember trying to teach us? I believe that one overall teaching of the Old Testament is the nature and the characteristics of God. It teaches us about his love. It teaches us about his forgiveness, his watching care for his people. It also teaches us about his anger because he can be angry with us if we do not follow his word. It teaches us the necessity of keeping his commandments. And this is what I want to talk about a little bit today is his commandments. I want to give a couple of uh, examples about the disobedience of God in the Old Testament and, and, and how he felt about it. Take the example of Nadab and Abihu in Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. And I read from the New King, New King James Version. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire thereon and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. I want you to pay particular attention to a couple of things. It was strange fire. Strange fire is, is anything that's not what is normally supposed to be. But one thing that I want you to keep in mind very closely is that the part of the scripture which he says he commanded them not. It means that he didn't tell them to do that and there was no command there to do that and they exceeded his commands. Also in 1 Samuel 15, when Saul and his army took it upon themselves to alter the instructions of God. If you can remember, Saul and his army were supposed to go, the Lord had told them to go and utterly destroy one of the nations. And by utterly destroyed, it meant kill everyone, kill all the cattle, destroy all the goods, do not bring anything back. And what did Saul do? He took it upon himself to bring some of the best back, thinking that it would be good to sacrifice those things to the Lord. The Lord did not want Saul's sacrifice. He wanted his obedience. And that's what he wants from us today. Remember the story of Uzzah first in 2 Samuel 6, 6 and 7? When Uzzah touched the Ark of the Covenant, when he thought it was about to fall off of the wagon. If you remember, the Philistines had captured the Ark of the Covenant and they had now uh, was returning it because it had caused them so much, uh, much, many problems. And it was on its way to the holy city when the oxen stumbled and Uzzah thought the Ark was going to fall and he touched it. God struck him dead immediately because, and there are two lessons here, one is, as Brother Yarbrough said in his talk the other night, God is in charge, and God was in charge there, and, he, and, and Uzzah disobeyed what God's commandment was, which was that the Levite children, Levite, children of Levites were supposed to, uh, the only ones that could touch the ark. Churches of Christ, when I was a young man, I heard this lesson over and over and over, they always endeavored to speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible is silent. We believe this is a scriptural plea based on 1 Peter 4.11 during the restoration where the admonition is to speak as the oracles of God in, in 1 Peter and neither to add to nor take away from the word of God. 
Speaking from the oracles of God, if we truly believe that the Bible is inspired, would be speaking from the word of God. In Deuteronomy 4.2, Moses writes, You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take away from it, that you may keep my, the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Moses repeats the same command in Deuteronomy 12, 32. Whenever I command you, whatever I command you, be careful to observe it, and you shall not add or take away from it. As you go through the Old Testament, God reemphasizes the commandment when he says to his, the children of Israel, if you keep my commandments, I will be your God, and you will be my people. In the New Testament, especially in the books of John and 1 John, he emphasizes the importance of keeping God's commands and includes and concludes with it in the book of Revelations in Revelation 22, 18 through 19 with these words. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of prophecy of this book and anyone adds to those things, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and from the things which are within the book. To take away from the word of God is to remove that which God has spoken. To add to the word of God is to interject that which God has not spoken. To diminish in any manner what God has explicitly said is to violate speaking where the Bible speaks. To add to the word of God is to speak where God has not spoken and by so doing violates the silence of the scripture. To speak and to be silent are equally valid principles in the scripture. Let me reemphasize that point. To speak and to be silent are equally valid principles in the scripture. Now let's talk a little bit about Bible authority. The Bible teaches in two basic ways, specifically and generically. And you may want to substitute implied by generic, but I use the word generic. Specific teaching is teaching in which something is commanded for or declared explicitly. It is what the Bible specifically says. Generic teaching is the teaching where somebody is not specifically commanded or declared, but is understood with logical reasoning from what's specific, specifically stated. In other words, generic teaching is that which is implied from implicit statements. Applying specific and generic statements. When a command is given in the scripture, Divine authority is established for whatever actions call for in the command. If God in his word specifies how or when or where or why to do a command, then we have specific authority for the how, when, where, or why. If he does not specify how, where, when, or why to do a command, we still have authority, but it's generic authority. In other words, he leaves that to our judgment. It should be noted that when God commands us to do something as part of his command might be specific while another part of the command might be generic. Let me give you a couple of biblical examples. Example, when God instructed Noah to build the ark, it was both specific and generic. In Genesis 6, he did not specifically tell Noah to build it out of wood. Instead, he specified gopher wood, which meant that only gopher wood was to be used. There was also generic instruction, such as how to get the wood and how to cut it. These things were left to Noah's judgment. New Testament example, March 16, 15, 16, which we all know. And he said unto them, go ye into the world, into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth us baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Specific command was go. Generic command, your choice of how to go. Go by mule, car, plane, you can walk. Back to specifics. When you get to wherever you're going, specific command, preach the gospel. Result, if it results in baptism of the, uh, in the baptism of believers, then it's a generic instruction. We know that baptism takes water, so you can do it in the lake, the baptistry of the swimming pool. These are just two examples of generic and specific commands. In conclusion, I want to talk to you just a little bit about the significance of silence. Since God has spoken all he intends to speak about all we need to know spiritually to go to heaven, 
I believe when he finished speaking, he hushed. I believe he added no more to give greater emphasis to what he had already spoken. The emphasis throughout the scripture is to hear, to listen truly to what God has said, and to hold fast uh, that message which you have been taught, as Paul stated to the Corinthian brothers in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 3. We must hear what God has said so we can understand and what he desires for our life, whether the subject that God speaks about is moral, practical, or doctrinal. Our task is to listen and understand his will. It is important that we hear all of what God says without coloring it to agree with our prejudices. Let the words of God be, his hush silent, like the words of God, his hush silence is significant. He finished the message when and where he intended it to be complete. We become presumptuous when we think we can or we need to improve on it. We should never think uh, that he hushed the hush silence that, that God did opened a door for us to invent our own practices and beliefs. God finished revealing his will and his revelation was perfect. We cannot add, subtract, or change what is perfect without corrupting the message. When God finished speaking, his self-imposed silence emphasizes what he said. To speak where the Bible speaks, to be silent where the Bible is silent. Silence is a powerful message. I close with this comment from Psalms 46.10. Be still and know that I am God. Would you bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful for this beautiful day that we have been uh, permitted to assemble here. Father, we thank you for your love and your care over us and your watch and care over us during this uh, uh, perilous times. Father, we pray that this will soon be over. We pray that as we go through our next week that you will keep us safe from harm, that you will soon bring us back together that we can meet together to worship you because we miss each other so much. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who you sent to this earth to die for the remission of our sins. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen.